But I want to invite you to take your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 4. We're in one of my favorite passages in Scripture uh, this morning because it's the, the pastor's, the elder's job description, uh, or at least part of it. Uh, and so uh, we're going to read uh, the passage that we looked at uh, last week as well because it's one section of Scripture. So we want to see it in its context together, how it relates to one another and uh, encourages us this morning. So Ephesians chapter 4, we'll be looking at uh, verses 11 through 16 this morning. And while you're turning there, uh, one of my favorite things to do, well, not my favorite things to do, but I enjoy, I guess if it was, I'd need new hobbies. But uh, one of the things I enjoy doing is if you drive continually past something that's being built, whether it's a business or a home, and it's just kind of on the road uh, where you're driving past, and you just get to see it move from stage to stage, you know, and sometimes when they're working on the inner workings, right, the plumbing, the, elect the electricians, or they're working and different things like that, it seems like the house got to a place, and then it's, right, it's dry, and, and then it's just, uh, seems like there's nothing happening, but there's a whole lot happening on the inside that's just not, avail uh, not quite as visible structurally, and then toward the end again, you start to see uh, everything kind of finish up, and it gets tidied up, and neatened up, and, and really begins to look beautiful. And you go, oh, wow, that seems so fast all of a sudden. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is very applicable to the body of Christ. The, the Apostle Paul uses the description of a, or the analogy of a, of a building that's being built, uh, built upon the cornerstone, the living cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. But he also uses, and here in particular, he uses the, um, the analogy of a body being built up together into Christ, who is the head Jesus Christ is the head of the body of Christ, and we are to grow up into Him. And we've seen in Ephesians so far that the Lord has won our hearts. The Lord has raised us from death to life. He has given us a purpose to see everything in the world united in Him, everything in the world, everything in the, in the heavenlies, which God says He is bringing to its fullness to be uh, completed in Christ where Christ will receive the glory, and then, of course, Jesus wants the Father to be glorified, just as the Holy Spirit wants to work in us to point everything toward Jesus. And so there's a beautiful working of, of our triune God that we see glorifying one another as they, He, rules in and through our hearts. So let's read together Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What a phrase. So that we may, be no, lo may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in Christ. I'm sorry, I jumped a line. We are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Well, would you join me in prayer? Because there is so much here for our minds and our hearts to take in together today. Heavenly Father, we come to you full of gratitude and thanksgiving that you've given us your word. We know, as we just sang as we prayed through these wonderful words that we sang, that our souls, our, ourselves, our hearts need not be discouraged because you are ruling and reigning and you have purpose for everything. And yet we find ourselves discouraged at times. We find ourselves dealing with a myriad of, of emotions and feelings and, and, and longings, and some of which are God-centered and, and some of which are uh, self-centered. And so, Lord, we pray again as we sang this morning that you, would, that you would strip it all away, that you would strip it all away so that our hearts would 
would long purely for you. And even in praying that, Lord, we recognize that that's a gift to us, that you would grant that to us, and yet you still call us to pray in that way. So we, we, we join together with the Holy Spirit who is working in our lives, that you would help us to lift our gaze, that we might know with confidence where our help comes from. It comes from no other person in this world, but from Jesus Christ alone. And even in that, you're working a dual reality where you call us to the privilege of helping one another so that you would receive the glory for everything good that happens in our lives. We pray to that end, Lord. Help us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Paul tells us very clear that that, that we are, and by we, I mean everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ and is... Uh, a part of a body of Christ, but that we are to be growing up into Christ through truth-saturated love. Truth-saturated love. A healthy church body values and pursues doctrinal discernment. A healthy church body values and pursues truth spoken in love. A healthy church body values comprehensive Christ-likeness, and a healthy church body uh, values and pursues every member ministry. So Paul has laid out one of God's um, provisions for the local church to be able to grow up into unity. Remember, he's been talking about unity, and, and last week he's, he talked about unity through diversity as we see a variety of gifts in the body of Christ. And now he's back to how the body helps itself grow up into unity, right? God has given spiritual leaders who are called by God to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And our ministry will keep us going until the end of time, right? Because we will all uh, have something to be growing in for all of our lives. I saw a meme recently that just said, you know, uh, churches always want great pastors until great pastors call them to be great Christians. You'll get there. Paul charges us in verse 13 to be unified in the faith. He calls us to be unified in the knowledge of the Son of God, right? Everything that relates to salvation and growth in Christ. He calls us to be growing up into mature manhood. And you're going to see a contrast here as he talks about how a healthy body values and pursues doctrinal discernment. One of the purposes for this building up of the church is so that believers would no longer be infants or no longer be children, Well, why? Because children need to be cared for continually. An infant is the picture of a a child at his mom's breast that needs uh, needs her for everything that he uh, receives in life. Certainly the Lord to keep his heart beating and different things like that, but from from an earthly food and provision standpoint, children, infants need everything. And so he's not saying it's wrong to ever be in that place. Everybody starts there as a spiritual infant. Everybody grows, well, not everybody, but, but everybody needs to grow through being a spiritual infant to a spiritual uh, child, right? You might say, you've got to go through the toddler phase in Christianity. Do you know there's nothing wrong with being a spiritual toddler in Christ? In fact, it's necessary. You, you need to learn how to waddle and walk and make those awkward, slow steps. But you know what those are? Progress. Progress and growth in Christ-likeness. It may not feel like it. But it's necessary. Time cannot be removed from the process of a child of God growing from spiritual infancy to mature manhood in Christ. This is a, a, it's less about a, a commentary on what the Ephesians lacked in their relationship with the Lord and with one another. It's more of a sober assessment of the risks that every Christian faces apart from a commitment to growth in Christ. Now, let that sink in for a minute. If we ever think that we can be passive and float against the the current of our world, you're sorely mistaken. If you're not putting feet to your faith, and I don't mean perfectly, no one runs a perfect race. So as you hear me challenging you today, or as the Apostle Paul challenges us today, really a a, a more accurate way of saying it, but as we're challenged today in the Word, what we need to recognize is the goal isn't to point out our deficiencies, 
but to be able to recognize them so that in, the, in, the, in Christ we're self-aware and can know what next steps we need to take. What are the next steps that we need for spiritual growth? It also helps us kick aside any of the excuses that we love to hang on to. Why? Not because we're, not because we're incapable of growth in Christ, but I think if we're honest, some of us are comfortable where we are. We have eternity to be comfortable. We have eternity, eternity to, 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 to live and not have to fight the fight of faith. But now we fight. As long it is called, as it is called today, we press on for the prize that is before us. Paul paints this uh, picture of a vulnerable, vulnerable vessel on the sea, and he tries to communicate the spiritual infancy he warns us against, right? The spiritually immature or the, the child in the faith is tossed around by the waves. We know a little something about wind here. Sometimes wind uh, or, or, or the, 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 um, the acts of God or the hand of God in creation we recognize is far beyond our ability to control it, to feel like we can even be stable in these times. And yet Paul contrasts or compares uh, our, our, these waves of doctrine that are against God, these winds that would try to blow us down blown around by every wind of teaching. This, there's this picture of, it's not always passivity, but it's this idea of being helpless and out of control. And God says, if you will grow up into me, if you will learn to, to love my law, you're not going to tell me what to do. Well, if you love Christ, he will, and you welcome it. You learn to love God's law, you learn to dive in a little at a time. Better yet, to dive in in the context of biblical community, opening up this word, growing in it together, helping one another. You'll be able to drop anchor in that storm and not be topsided. You'll be able to stand with your feet planted firmly. Now, I talked about no passivity here. But firmly planted feet is definitely not passive when you are standing against every wind that would come your way. It requires effort. It requires commitment and, and partnership with the Holy Spirit. And that's Paul's desire for us. We, we don't want to be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning. Brothers and sisters, Satan is crafty. He's smart. He's not going to win, but he's smart. He's deceptive. He doesn't come at you when you're alert and awake and ready for it. He waits till you're tired. Tired from doing what? Following Christ. Some of my greatest, it sounds weird to say it this way, but some of my most, I don't know, times I look back in my life and I say, what a wonderful season of growth in Christ, or what a wonderful my, my, uh, event or, or time or night in my walk with Christ and almost unfailingly, right after that, Satan comes at me. Satan comes at me. Well, if I'm not ready for that, then I'm, I'm more susceptible to his temptations. Now watch, Paul contrasts, he talks about children. He's, he's talking about individuals who are children, not people growing up into the one body of Christ. And an, an enemy can come after one soldier easily and pick him off. But standing united as a body, that army has much greater potential to defend herself, to defend itself. And so only when we each value, each of us pursue doctrinal discernment, can we be healthy through and through. And we guard against first this every wind of doctrine, this diff different kinds of teaching, which stand over and against the unity of the body of Christ, which Paul is encouraging his, his readers, those he calls uh, children in the faith at times, or those he calls beloved or children of the Lord here. 
Hebrews 13, 9 says, Do not be led, us, led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have benefited those devoted to them. In other words, when we believe that those who teach doctrine uh, that is contrary to the Word of God will, will be led astray, when we believe those who teach doctrine contrary to the Word then we will be led astray. But in contrast to this, the Lord wants us to be strengthened by grace. Now, in context here in this passage in Hebrews, he's talking about not adding anything to the faith. He's not talking about teaching the, the commands of the Lord for how we are to live in Christ. I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say something along the lines of, well, they want me to do this or do that. Or... Hey, listen, friends, if it's in Scriptures... If it's in the Scripture, and we're helping one another, encouraging one another, exhorting one another, rebuking one another, so that we grow in Christ's likeness, friends, that is not legalism. Mark it down. Let's be quite clear. That's not legalism. It's a pursuit of godliness when it's joined with the loving, humble hearts that say it. Sometimes we like to use the, the legalism shield. Well, they just want me to be legalistic. No, we want you to love God and grow in, in, in the Word of God so that you'll be able to stand with the body of Christ in the truth and in the, the ways that He has given us to grow up into Him. And as we do this, as we, as we sit in the Word and we recognize that I had nothing to my salvation, but I had much to my sanctification. Paul calls us to work out our faith, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. There's an earnestness that he gives us. Secondly, her, human cunning, he says, we're carried away uh, this idea of dice playing, right? Where the, the dice, think about this, right? You go to a, um, a uh, what are they called? Casino. Some of you are afraid to say it in church. <laughs> You're like, oh I, oh, I can't say it here. You think, oh, the house doesn't ever want you to win. And so the idea is that there's dice that's rigged, right? Cubes that are rigged, ways that uh, we're going to lose. Well, not every time because then we'll be on to them, right? They're going to let us win enough to, to keep going at it. Here's what he's saying is Satan is the enemy who likes to use trickery. Ungodly spiritual cunning in order to try to trick us in the wrong way to walk. And that's why we, we can't be children. We must grow up into Christ. Christ, he talks about craftiness and deceitful schemes, brings to mind the ploys of Satan we've kind of already talked about, but it's just another way of layering this truth uh, one upon another. In the same way that he has deceived Adam and Eve and a host of others, he is now still seeking to deceive others. Listen to Colossians 2.8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. If you're a Christian who's not growing in the Word actively, you may pick up some things here and there, but the childlike or the childish Christian, and I don't mean any of this to be derogatory. What I'm saying is, what I'm suggesting is actually what God is telling us is, that if we're not growing up into Christ, we're gullible, we're susceptible, we're an easy target for the enemy to pick off. And do you know that has ramifications not only for your life, but for the body of Christ, for the entire body of Christ. So doctrinal discernment, it, mean, it means knowing the right course of action to take because you know and you believe the Bible's truth, or, or you're growing in it. Sometimes we might be tempted Notice that word tempted to believe, well, why even try? I'm at this age already. I've got so much truth that I don't know. Like, why? I'm never going to learn it all. Well, you might not learn it all, but you know what? Neither is the Christian who's 99 years old and faith, faithfully following Jesus. The 99-year-old and the 9-year-old need to strive every day out of love for Christ. 
And so when we know and we believe the Bible's truth for life, we're able to judge the, the many, many, many messages around us that are seeking to deceive us, right? It's like uh, listening with the ears of our heart, which, has been, which have been tuned to God's truths, similar to how Paul prayed just a couple chapters ago, three chapters ago in Ephesians 1.18, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. So to be a healthy body, we need to value and we need to pursue doctrinal discernment. A healthy church body also values and pursues truth spoken in love. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So notice the word rather. It's a contrast. Pick up on these, pick up on these contrasts as you read the word. Rather than being a child, we are to grow up. That means through childhood. Childhood's okay, but don't live there. Walk in Christ, put into practice the ways that God has given you to grow up into Him, and you'll grow, not by the way you design, almost guarantee that. But God is faithful to use your circumstances, your relationships, your, your successes, your failures, your temptations, all of it to give you a humble heart, a passion for God's to, truth, a gratitude for salvation, and a desire, a passionate desire for the body of Christ. Because we need everybody to be working well together uh, according to the way that God has given us every person and gift to make us grow ourselves up in love. So notice that, that contrast there. Nobody grows in their faith passively, not one. You might grow in knowledge because you listen to people, you listen well, and you have a good memory. Praise God for that memory. That doesn't mean you're growing up in faith. It doesn't mean you're growing up into Christ. And so what does he say? Rather than that, we're supposed to speak the truth in love. This requires balance. And this is where, this is where it's so easy for us to fail. Uh, and we fail often in this. Why? Well, because we're given different gifts. We're given different passions. We're given different uh, abilities, right? Some of us are, love knowledge, and we love doctrine, and we love truth. And so we just want to let people have it with the truth, knowing and, and thinking that the truth and God working through His truth will change people. And that's partially true, but it's not entirely true. Now, a man in a prison on his own, can God use his word through the Holy Spirit alone to grow someone up in faith? Absolutely. Put somebody in a prison cell and they know real quickly what their priorities are, who to look to for help. Yeah, absolutely. But God's uh, normal everyday practice is for believers to be coming alongside one another, not only with truth, but with truth spoken in love. There's a balancing act that each of us, each and every individual needs to be careful, mindful, humble to pursue. But even outside of the individual, the God, uh, God brings together a body together to speak the truth in love. And see, we work with one another as one may be more gifted in, in uh, truth and doctrine. Another may be more gifted in the practical expression of love and just have a, an incredible patience that another person who's gifted in truth does not have. And so we need to strive for this as individuals, and we need to strive for this corporately as a local body of church. If I don't love you the way Christ would call me to love you, I am going to be less effective in speaking the truth to you. But see, if I love you in a way that is less than God, in, in a way that would be, uh, let me say it like this, less than or different than biblical love as described in the Bible, I am also less helpful in speaking truth to you. You see, you, 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 you might love people or care about people or, or be afraid of losing someone so much that you're afraid that if I share the truth of God's Word with them, well, they just may leave the church. Well, if we're speaking truth and we're walking in love. Now, love is sacrificial. Love requires time. Love requires patience. Love requires inconvenience. Love requires, well, a whole lot of things. And so we speak the truth, we walk patiently, pursuing one another out of love. This is God's recipe to help the body of Christ grow. It means knowing the Word of God. Truth means knowing the Word of God so that we're able to quote it, apply it, 
and help others do the same correctly. So that we're not taking a verse out of its context and then plastering it for the world to see, which effectively changes the meaning of what that verse actually means in its context. Which, friend, quoting a series of words in the Bible does not automatically equal truth. I I read a a post one time about this, and I don't even remember the details, and it's probably good, but uh, it was a church that posted something on their door quoting Satan. Words in the Bible, in a particular context, plastered on a church door or church sign in Satan's attempt to deceive. So we have to be careful. And love requires truth, right? Being nice to someone. God doesn't call us to nice. He calls us to love. Every parent and grandparent knows this. Sometimes you love your children in ways that, that, honestly, they wouldn't be like, yeah, this is on my top 10 list of ways that you can love me today, right? You could give me cookies and ice cream and this and this, but green stuff? I mean, unless it's like green sprinkles? No, that doesn't seem very loving to me, right? Discipline? That feels like you don't like me. And a parent says, what's every parent say, right? This hurts me more than it hurts you. There were times, there were, there've been times I've had to discipline my children where I almost wept. Knowing that bringing some pain, moderate, healthy pain, is what's required to train them up in the ways of the Lord. And I hated it. I still don't like it. In fact, as your kids get older, discipline becomes less convenient. Follow through, man, that is inconvenient. It's so much easier for me to cave and not deal with the whining and the coming after you and the, which can go on and on. But what are we doing? If we love them, We persist in what is right for them. Ultimately, our goal is to to show them the love of God. And in the way that we love and teach and train our kids, we give them an, an imperfect model, for sure, but of the love of God. If we are more concerned, church family, about being a certain size or uh, attracting a certain demographic or, or many other possibilities that we'd put in there, then we are with trusting God's methods, which He has laid out in Scripture for building and growing His church, then we are not being lovely, lovely, loving. We're actually loving ourselves and using people for our purposes. Now, I know that can get cloudy because we all want to see more and more people come to the knowledge of saving faith through Jesus Christ. But we cannot abandon God's definition of love or God's priorities as laid out in Scripture in a push for what the world would call acceptance, which is very perverted in and of itself, very uh, inconsistent, very hypocritical even in and of itself. And so we know God's goals and God's means and God's method for the health of the church, which is that the love of Christ, which has saved us and cleansed us, calling us from darkness to light, that's the controlling force for our love for others. It's pressing down on us, moving us in our loving attempts to persuade others with God's loving truth. Listen to how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5, 13 through 16. He says, if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. And if we're in our right mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one, his name is Jesus, has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, Jesus, who was raised for their sake, died for their sake and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, our earthly understanding, we don't regard him that way any longer. 
It's not as though our strong love, when he says that phrase, for the love of Christ, it's not as though our strong, persistent love of Christ controls us. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a downward pressing from the love of Christ, which controls or compels us to live in ways that are consistent with the truth of God. And so the Lord moves Paul to say, I'm saying some things I know you think I'm crazy. And if you think I'm crazy and it, it moves to no end, that's okay. I'm doing it for the Lord. But if you hear me, if you hear the Lord through this, it's for Christ. It's for your sake. And God will use it and move uh, to build his kingdom in this, in this Corinthian church. And so we're to, we're to understand the, 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 the meaning and the message so that we can speak it to one another faithfully. But not do we only need to speak it, we need to be able to uh, faithfully speak it. Let me rephrase, I, I, I skipped a word. Not only do we need to be able to speak the truth in love, we need to speak it. Knowing the truth, loving people without speaking the truth is disobedience. Knowing the truth, loving people without speaking the truth in love is disobedience. And God calls us as a church family to be able to take this word and learn it a little at a time and see the Holy Spirit, wherever you are, I'm, I'm telling you, you just, just, just embark on the journey. If you're not there right now, just embark on the journey. You will get in your word. You will pray, Lord, help me understand what I see about you, what I see about myself, and what you're calling me to do in response to reading your word this morning. How do you want me to love you more? How do you want me to believe in you more? How do you want me to trust you more? And I will promise you, it may not happen on the same day, but in close proximity of your time, engaging in the, in the word of God. God, through the Holy Spirit, in the context of the body of Christ, God, you will see God shows up in ways that He's been waiting to show up the whole time. We just need to get in the river of God's, of, God's, of God's blessing, of God's ministry, of God's working in our lives so that we are able by the gift of God's grace to be able to work and show it in the lives of others. God will use you, child. God will use you. Do you believe God will use you? One of the greatest waves of doctrine, winds of, of the sea and waves of doctrine that Satan wants you to believe is that you are too much of a loser to be used by God. And Jesus said, I have died so that you might have life to the fullest. I have come that you might have life abundantly. Christian, that's a promise for everyone who trusts in the Lord. I want you to listen to uh, David Pallison, who recently... Uh, went to be with the Lord, but he said, Jesus genuinely, generously empowers his disciples with communicable attributes. Can we put this uh, quote up on the screen? Uh, with communicable attributes. Those are God's attributes or, or characteristics that he shares with, with humans and, and especially Christians. But uh, that he, so he generously empowers disciples with his communicable attributes that give us what it takes to counsel or to speak the truth in love well. He teaches us to treat people with a wise love that can search out every wrinkle of the human condition. The Redeemer makes us under-redeemers, under-shepherds, under-counselors who can aid others where they need it. He offers insights, love, and skills that can take root in our lives individually and communally. Wise love, intelligent joy, savvy peacemaking, patient engagement with people over the long haul are what the church is by definition. Counseling or, or speaking the truth in love to one another is the prime expression of these things. It is what the church or the wonderful counselors trainees is all about. So doctrinal discernment gives us a desire and a confidence to speak the truth in love, which leads us to together valuing and pursuing comprehensive Christ-likeness. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into Him, into Christ. This is a lifelong journey. Jesus prayed for us. He said, sanctify them, which means set them apart as holy. Set them apart as unto me, so that the world would look and know that these are my people. They love my word. They want to live my way. They want to pursue me with their whole lives in a way that is ridiculous to the world around us. It doesn't make sense. They scratch their head, which is why they attack us. 
because you say, well, this is the only way to live, right? We can't pick our religion. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And so we even have a, after a long time of Christian living, Paul is self-aware of his failings, and he's still resolved. This is a man who says, I'm going to keep pressing on. Listen, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. He says, not that I've already attained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Jesus made you his own. But one thing I do, I forget what lies behind. I'm not ruled by my past. I'm not controlled by my past. I forget it in a, in a, in a not a literal, I don't remember it anymore, but I forget it so that it functionally doesn't control me anymore. And I look to the Lord, I forget what lies behind, and I strain. You hear the work in there? You hear the effort in there? I strain toward what lies ahead. And I press on toward the goal the pro, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This means that when we uh, each labor to make loyalty to the church and coming alongside one another with love and truth both in hand, a significant and tangible reality rather than mere statements of good intentions. I know I need to. Well, you don't intend to. Or do you? As we're hearing this this morning, I want to ask you how the Holy Spirit may be leading in your heart to help you grow up into Christ likeness by, by learning how to speak the truth in love with one another, to one another, and also learning to hear it from others in the body of Christ. Jesus says in John 4, 14, 15, uh, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Well, not me, because I have a really hard difficulty. I have a really hard problem. I've got something that's, that's life dominating, and so mine is one of the special exceptions. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Well, that won't really work for me because I've got this thing that has a stronghold on my life. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. You might put in parentheses and trust me with the results. It's called faith. The Lord says, live this way. Well, I'm going to try my own way. Okay. But Jesus says, if you love me, you will help me obey what I command. This means that your thought life should mature in Christ. Your emotional life should grow up into Christ. Your relationship should grow into Christ. And think about how we use people in our lives with relationships. Do you, do you love people selflessly or maybe without even realizing it? This may be an eye-opener for you. Do we use people to get what we want out of this life or from them? Maybe to make us feel comfortable, maybe to make us feel safe, maybe to make us feel secure, maybe to help me attain a status or a position or a friendship or not feel lonely. You see, biblical love is very different than we understand it to be, right? It, it means using your body, eating and exercising and rest, and I'm telling you that as a guy who wrestles with it and struggles with it. I'm into a new season of, okay, let's go after the Lord in this again. How will I do? I don't know. I'm going to strive. I'm going to pursue. I'm going to make some difficult choices. I've got accountability. Brothers and, and sisters who, will, who know me enough to know when I'm, I'm not striving. Hey, I thought you said you were going to really give this a go for the goal of glorifying God. Yeah, I know. Okay, I repent. Lord, I failed thank you that my failure doesn't strip me from your grace. So today I'm going to press on. We're going to strive for a few more hours, another day. I'm going to go hard after you. How to conduct yourself in business, how you spend your time, your money, your possessions. There's no area of our life that's unaffected by the fruit of our doctrinal discernment, which leads us to speak the truth in love, helping us to grow up in a comprehensive Christ-likeness. Now I want to ask you as we close, uh, that's like just the pastor's way of being like, hey, don't go to sleep, come back. <laughs> I want to ask you to take note of your heart's response right now. Are you, are you angry about something I've said and therefore have shut down? That's an indicator from the Holy Spirit to you. You don't need to feel condemned by it. Why? Well, because Jesus paid the penalty for that sin. All of it, all of it, every ounce 
midst of it, every ounce of God's wrath that is due to you and to me for running from God, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It's not like medium gray. It's not a slight dash of pink. I better get back to it here because... The point is, listen, friend, wherever you're at today, you're here sitting under the the gracious teaching of God's Word, not because of me, but because God's given us His Word. So how are you responding to this? Do you think, well, yeah, that's for everybody else. Well, I would implore you to come to the Lord in faith and turn from that unbelief and trust Him. So I have been striving, and it hasn't been working as I thought it would. Yeah, that's mostly, that's Mostly true most of the time. The Lord's ways are different, which is why Proverbs tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will make straight your paths. But it may be way down the road. You may still be walking around a bend, and you don't see the straight path ahead of you yet. The Lord is with you, walking with you, equipping you, caring for you. So do not be discouraged. Secondly, you don't need to walk it alone. God gave us a body to do this together. So whatever your heart's response, I would encourage you to just maybe express that to somebody else in the church this morning. You know, this message really pricked my heart in this way today. And I don't know if I feel like I have the energy to go it alone on this. Or would you pray for me in this way when we celebrate the Lord's Supper in a few minutes? This is really a wonderful time for us to talk to one another as the body of Christ. I don't mean like chit-chat. Hey, how was your week? Good. Yeah, my, my week was good. Chit. No, I mean coming alongside each other in love and saying, I am wrecked in my life and I need somebody else to come alongside me. Honestly, I'm too ashamed to even say it out loud, but I know that if I don't, I will be ensnared for many days, weeks, months, years to come, maybe even my whole life, and I love the Lord, and I know He gave His Son for me, and I do not want to be ensnared. A healthy church body values and pursues every member ministry. Robbie Gallaty rightly points out that ministry or serving one another is the pathway to maturity, never the other way around. We do not grow to maturity in Christ inside a box or inside a pattern of living Uh, the Christian life on our own. In fact, I would say you're not living the Christian life because Christian life requires those of you who seem to like to go it alone, those of you who who one day were really engaged in the church and now you just have other things going on. I'm not trying to assume your heart. What I know is that if we're not connected in relationship in the body of Christ, we're not living Christ-like Christianity, right? You ever broken or stubbed a smaller toe, like your pinky toe or the one next to you? I don't even know if that has a name, whatever that thing's called, right? You, you stub your toe. And I'm telling you, I was telling somebody the other day, when you stub your toe, I mean, that hurts in a whole way that you just don't even know how to describe sometimes, right? And what do you do? I mean, you can throw out your hips or your back compensating for the pain that they can't put a cast around, right? You're walking or, or it starts to get a little bit better. And all of a sudden you forget about it a little bit and you kick it on something else and you're on your knees, wishing you had a passy. There's a point to this. Your body can get thrown out of whack by compensating for that one small piece of your body that most of your life you don't even acknowledge or recognize is there. And I just wonder how the body of Christ is limping along. I wonder how one joint in the body of Christ it is out of whack and needs to go to the spiritual chiropractor because one of us, two of us, five of us, 30 of us are not doing our part. I mean, that's not my language. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love everyone, everyone. I know some of you don't even want to make eye contact with me right now. I'm not making fun. I'm saying we love you. The Lord loves you and gave his life for you, and he wants you to be an actively engaged, growing part of the body of Christ, using your Bible to learn from others, and then in time, share what you have learned with others, not just in terms of facts, but in terms of how to live the Christian life. 
Would you ask the Lord when we take communion in just a moment here to help reveal to you the ways that, that He is calling you to be engaged in helping the body of Christ grow up in love? Father, you're so gracious to us that you would call us to be your children. You're so gracious to us that you would allow us to be um, building a part of building one another up in love. Lord, you're so gracious to us to, uh, to teach us, to love us, to save us. What we all deserve is eternal damnation because we run from you. And we run and we run and we run. And yet you, you saved us and you brought us from darkness to life so that we might tell others of your goodness and grace and love. And then strive together toward Christ's likeness as we grow up into you, not into a pastor, not into a, a certain mold of church, but into you, so that then what flows from us as a body is mutual love in Christ's likeness that the community will take note of. You'll do your work in, in growing us into maturity and, and allowing others that don't know you yet to Get wind of what we or another Jesus preaching church is sharing. And so we can trust you with that. But Lord, there are some in here this morning for one reason or another are, are either stuck in a place of, of serving you in really easy ministry so they can, well, I don't want to assume motives, but that aren't desiring or willing to take the next step in their walk with you. Maybe they're tired. Maybe they've been hurt. I don't know. You do. It's another reason we praise you, because you know our hearts full well. You know everything that we need, and you've given it to us in your word. We lack nothing for our growth in you, but sometimes we lack things because we're running from you. Lord, would you convict us and help us to turn, make a U-turn and run headlong for you this morning? As we remember your body that lived a perfect life, gave, gave yourself on, the, on Calvary, this bread that we eat represents your sacrificial death being hung on that cross so that we who lift up the name of Jesus can trust you to draw all men to yourself. And as we drink this blood, we're reminded, Lord, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so none of us in this room are forgiven by getting, getting a part of the body of Christ or, or working harder or pressing on in our faith like Paul. No, like Paul, we all start at the foot of the cross and we acknowledge that you shed your blood, that we might have the opportunity to turn around and trust you in faith. And so help us get there first, trusting you fully, without one ounce of our own contribution to salvation, and then all that we've got to follow you in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.